much to the bane of rail fans, local and abroad, Northeastern Pennsylvania has a bad and a well-deserved reputation for capturing overcast skies and can easily go for days without ever seeing the sun. Maybe that's why the BBC called us the most unhappy region in America. Today's forecast called for morning overcast scattering out to sunshine as we neared the afternoon. That's what we were counting on as we began what would become a chaotic frenzy around the area as we chased trains between several different railroads. Today I'm rail fanning with JC of Fire and Film Photography and a YouTube channel of the same name. There's a link to his channel in the description of this video so you can check him out. We started our rail fanning adventure at milepost 678 in Avoca at the York Road crossing. Directly to the right of us is the petrol gas propane facility and one of the stops on today's local job out of Taylor Yard. At 628, our first train of the day showed up in the form of the Allentown bound train 36T with three black diesels trumpeting by elephant style. In typical operating fashion, the 36T must stop at DuPont Junction before diverging onto the Reading and Northern's Lehigh Division. This gave us enough time to set up at our next location. In an earlier video, we got a look at the DuPont's main street from the perspective of the locomotive engineer. I pointed out that the main line signal and its accompanying dwarf signal on track 2 had been moved further up the track, closer to the switch. I'd also pointed out that track 2 of the line had been upgraded to main line class 1 standards since that time and now we get to see those improvements firsthand as our 36T eases its way onto the line, kicking up a fuss as it heads in our direction.
In addition to stopping at the signal at CP679, trains coming off of the Norfolk Southern have to move at a slow to restricted speed until the entire train clears the switch, making long trains like this one a bane to early morning motorists. The chaos is evident more than five minutes after the locomotives passed our location. Looking back toward the junction, you probably noticed that green clear signal over on track one. We're now on the Reading and Northern Lehigh line, which is the former Lehigh Valley Mountain cutoff. The track to the right with the green signal is the main line which leads into Durier and Pittston and the Reading and Northern's Pittston Yard. That green signal is for the Reading and Northern's Pittston turn to Lee Heighton, the Pittston fast freight known by rail fans as the PIF train. Not long after train 37T's marker rounded the bend and out of sight, the PIF train's power came screaming down the hill with two EMD SD40-2's leading the charge. Let's go get 11Z. And get the 11Z we did. And fortunately for us, we didn't have to go too far to do it. Rail fanning Main Street in DuPont is always nice because you get two railroads for the price of one. Just a few hundred feet from the RNN main line is the Norfolk Southern main line and the train 11Z which was en route to us from around the Taylor Yard. In a short time, the headlight of a black tier 4 diesel lit up the rails as train 11Z with a long train in tow stormed over the Main Street crossing. Of particular interest to me on this particular train was that General Electric number 8000 trailing from behind. It's the class unit of the AC Jeevos on NS. In 2010, NS ordered 42 additional ES44 ACs from GE. NS was quite the power short railroad at that time and GE was able to deliver the units almost immediately. The reason for this was an order for around 24 AC Jeevos that NS bought in the fall of 2008. These were the NS's first newly purchased AC locomotives on the railroad. The reason that GE could deliver the second batch of Jeevo so fast was because the materials were already in the pipeline for a CSX ES44 AC order, which was canceled. This is why to this day, NS ES44 ACs are built to CSX specs. Those 24 units were a landmark token order for the NS and the performance of those ES44 ACs along with those of Conrail's SD80 Max finally convinced the railroad to start shifting to AC traction having held out for years.
In addition to being a part of the DuPont Junction interlocking, milepost HA679.92, I just call it milepost 680, is also notorious for the main street that it crosses. The crossing gates are constantly being knocked off their stands by impatient motorists trying to beat the train. This morning, a heavy rain has just fallen, leaving just enough rust on the rails to highlight the still visible scars left on the tracks from the firestorm of the rail grinder more than a month ago. Even more interesting was this generation's old D&H no trespassing sign which clearly has seen its share of trains pass by. I have to give credit to JC for pointing this little railroad artifact out to me. In typical morning fashion, the K81 local job will normally follow the 11Z down as far as Yatesville and sometimes go down as far as Buttonwood. Today is no different and just a few minutes after the 11Z echoed its way down the line, the power for the K81 charged south behind it, engines light, to perform a set off in building number 7. The craziness began with the freight car shuffle that had to be done before the actual set off took place. When we finally got to Yatesville, the K81 was knuckling onto a cut of car so that it had everything in the right order so that the set out could be made. The power on today's K81 represents the Alpha and the Omega of Jivo power on the NS. The number 7686 is an ES44 DC that came to NS and was placed in service in November of 2007. The 3642 is an ET44 AC and is one of the newest locomotives on the railroad. But here's where things start to get chaotic. The K81 will have to juggle cars around to get enough spacers to allow them to make their set off into building number 7. The buffer cars are needed because the light density rail leading up to building number 7 can't handle the enormous weight of today's big 6 axle locomotives.
When switching Building 7, this is about as far as those big GEs can go. The story is very much the same over where we were at the Petrogas facility in Avoca where buffer cars have to be used to perform the switching duties there. Today, the K81 crew is lucky as the cars have already been spotted close enough to the main line so that buffer cars won't be needed to pick up these empty tank cars later in the day. That train out on the main line, that's the 36T that we caught at the start of this video. But the real reason that I wanted to make this pause is to talk about this. Now calm down, I'm not talking about those Conrail quality Dash 8s or that Grey Ghost Dash 9 or that unit cold train, although they are nice. I'm talking about the track alignment that the train is on. BT dubs, I've been told that the X-Con Dash 8 Ws are next on NS's chopping block. We'll talk about that in a later video. For now, notice how the junction looked back in the mid 2000s as opposed to how it looks today. All switching had to be done from the main line, unlike today where there's now a siding for the switching. This siding was one of the last upgrades that Canadian Pacific made before selling the line to NS. In an even older picture, you can see how this area looked back in the days of the original Delaware and Hudson. By the time the cut is made, the car is set out and the gates come up more than five minutes have passed leaving a lot of frustrated motorists. Unfortunately, it's a maneuver that can't be avoided and Conductor O'Donnell of this train tells me that he's had his share of choice words hurled at him from angry motorists. But remember this, the railroad was there first. The conductor informed us that their next move would be back in Avoca. By the time we got there, the K81 was already coupled to those empty tank cars and pulling them out onto the main line. Notice that the power has been split. This is so that they can get this train into Taylor Yard. Now follow me on this. Every track at the north end of Taylor Yard is blocked with intermodal or freight. 
K81 will have to enter from the south, and once in the yard, they'll cut off the number 7686, shove the cars into the yard with the 3642, cut away, hook back up to the 7686, and then recouple onto their train in the yard. Keeping in mind that all of this back and forth takes time, something crews have a limited amount of. Seeing this trailer makes me think of a video that's currently on the editing board and in the pipeline. Do you remember a few months back when I said this? Anything, anywhere, anytime. When was the last time you heard railroading speak of such commitment to customer service? You can expect that video probably this month. We tried to outpace the K81 to Taylor and once again they beat us to the punch. They'll now perform that all too time consuming move that I just explained to you. By this time, the clouds were scattering out as advertised, so while the K-81 did its thing in Taylor, we made our way south to Pittston where, in a scenario similar to the one in Volume 1 of the first summer series, some r and power was moving about the yard. It was around 11 a.m., and as soon as the power move was complete, the PISB train, with that same power that came in on the PIF train, was just getting underway.
Okay, before we get underway, now is a good time to talk about the track that this train is on. Despite its somewhat light density broken down appearance, this track is the former Delaware, Lackawanna and Western Bloomsburg branch to Northumberland, Pennsylvania. The Bloom began its existence as the Lackawanna and Bloomsburg Railroad in 1852. Its original charter allowed construction as far as Bloomsburg with the possible extension to Danville, Pennsylvania. A later amendment to the charter permitted construction as far as Sunbury. When completed, the line connected with the Lackawanna main line just west of Bridge 60 and proceeded in a generally southwest direction through Taylor and Old Forge, eventually reaching the Lehigh Valley's Coxon Yard where we currently are. After crossing the Susquehanna River, it proceeded along the Susquehanna to reach Kingston, Berwick, Bloomsburg, Danville, Rupert, and Northumberland. Along the way, the Lackawanna crossed over the Susquehanna River again to access some properties in Luzerne County and Hanover Township and Nanticoke. These properties are known as Concrete City and have long since been abandoned. Further west, the line provided interchange with the Reading Railroad in Rupert, Pennsylvania and Northumberland. The Bloom continued to operate after the Erie Lackawanna merger and continued interchanging with the Reading and the Pennsylvania Railroad into Penn Central and until Conrail in 1976. When Conrail took over most of the Erie Lackawanna in northeastern Pennsylvania, operations on the Bloom changed drastically. Conrail operated the line between Beach Haven and Northumberland on the west end and between Kingston and Scranton on the east end. The part between Kingston and Beach Haven was abandoned and ripped out shortly after Conrail began. Today, the North Shore operates the west end and the Luzerne and Susquehanna operates the east end and the Reading and Northern operates the line from Pittston to Taylor as you see here. The line from Taylor to Steamtown is part of the Sunbury line operated by NS and the DL Short Line. The track seen above the train is the Lehigh Valley Mountain Cutoff and is what the PIF train uses in and out of Pittston Yard. Old Forge is considered by many people to be the pizza capital of the world. I'm not kidding either. That's a claim that the town makes and it's known all over the world. I've had Old Forge style pizza and it's some of the best pizza that I've had anywhere. And I've had a lot of pizza. More to our interest is the Bloom which now makes a part of the Reading and Northern Scranton branch. The PISB train is now on the move and approaches with the fouled air horn. See that brown building? That's the Old Forge station no longer serving the railroad, long since converted for commercial use.
We beat the PISB train to Taylor in what should have been just another day turned into chaos once again. On a normal day, the PISB will get permission from the Yardmaster in Binghamton to move up track 17. As you learned from the last summer series, the yard job cuts away and works Taylor Yard, usually setting off cars on track 2 and picking up on track 1. Today, the 92W's work train is occupying track 2 and instead of letting the 92W's lone SD60E number 6981 couple onto their train and move out of the yard and out of everyone's way, the powers that be in a galaxy far, far away decided that the yard job should flip-flop their train. This means that the lone GP38-2 will have to leave its inbound cars on track 17, uncouple, move over to track 1, pick up those cars, move back over to track 17 and couple back onto its incoming cars, move back over to track number 1 and drop its incoming cars on track 1 and do whatever other work it has to do. This amounts to that single jeep shoving about 40 cars up the formidable grade into the yard and tying up the roads through and into the yard. Like I said, a day of chaotic railroading between two railroads.
The last thing we'll talk about in this video is the number 2011. In the last summer series, the X Southern Railway Jeep still retained its high, short hood just like the 2010 we saw a little earlier. However, all three high hood Jeep 38-2s acquired by the Reading and Northern from NS have all had their noses chopped and are awaiting new green and yellow paint.
Now that the yard job has cleared the depot road crossing, it's time for us to clear out. Summers were made for rail fanning, and we can only ponder what the rail fanning of summer of 2019 has in store for us. Until next time, for Trains 21, call me AC.